This latest ceasefire occurred after fighting re-erupted inside Tigray. This period of, of conflict you know, compounded an already incredibly difficult situation for a region of around six million people, most of whom are assessed as, as needing some form of humanitarian assistance. There's a few different interpretations of exactly what led to this truce. I think it's a combination of the political, military and humanitarian sort of economic factors. What, what we know is that during the first phase of this latest round of fighting, um, this you know, fairly large regional force that the Tigrayans had built up was able initially to resist the efforts by the Eritrean and Ethiopian militaries and their allies to sort of move into the region. But around sort of a month, you know, six weeks, um, that began to change um, and it became fairly obvious, including by their own admission, that the Tigrayan leaders were struggling to withstand this onslaught. You know, the, the massed forces against it, including the Federal Air Force and drones, as well as Eritrean artillery. When the Tigray delegation, the negotiating delegation, went to Pretoria to meet with the federal government delegation, they were almost desperate for a truce because of those very disadvantageous you know, military and economic and political circumstances they faced. In terms of the cessation of hostilities agreement, um, first of all, it was much broader and deeper than your usual cessation of hostilities agreement or truce. It was actually called a permanent cessation of hostilities. And this really reflected that, I think, because of the Tigrayan leadership's desperation for some form of respite, you know, for the fighting to stop and to try a path of negotiations instead. Um, there were a number of political concessions that they made um, in order to get the federal government to agree to any form of a cessation of hostilities. The point is that the alternative for the federal government and its Eritrean government allies was that as they were militarily ascendant, they could have pushed on, it may have taken some time and been very costly, but they could have pushed on, tried to take control of the regional capital and force um, the Tigray leadership, the, the, the TPLF, the ruling party, to flee the capital and to engage in some form of insurgency. Despite the fact that um, the, the federal government had this military advantage, um, they agreed to a truce, but it seems like they only agreed to a truce because the Tigray leadership made these very significant political concessions. None of the political issues that led to this war have been resolved. There's no doubt that this peace process is going to face, and does face, massive challenges. But if both parties in the federal and Tigray leadership, if they maintain committed to the path of negotiations and ultimately peace, then that can prevent a, a disastrous breakdown of this peace process. You're given the your huge needs and the considerable fragility of this peace process, there's an obvious need for the international community to remain vigilant. Of course, if we should be approaching you know, what sort of looks like a crisis point, um, or if there is a clear and sustained impasse in any important part of this peace process, whether it's humanitarian um, restoration of federal authority, the Western Tigray issue, the withdrawal of Eritrean troops, or the disarmament provisions for the Tigray forces, if there is a significant impasse in any of those um, critical elements, then the international community, primarily the African Union, supported by its partners, needs to bring um, you know, the, the, the main parties, federal government and, and then Tigray leadership together again to try and you know, resolve whatever problems there might be.